Here. So we got quite a few people already up in here. We got 18 viewers with 10 likes already. Thank you so much for joining in. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the manufacturing out of China and how they're going to use a particular strategy to destroy the rest of manufacturing in the world, but pretty much to eliminate the competition out there. Now, this is a very interesting strategy that I feel that China is using right now in order to keep the manufacturing base within their homeland. One of the problems that uh, faces a lot of manufacturing nations out there is that once they have become a major producer of stuff and they start sending that stuff out to the world, the world starts sending them money and their standard of living starts to increase and their competition to manufacture is no longer as competitive as a lot of other foreign competition can be out there. Did I say all that right? Sorry, <laughs> kind of stumbled my words there a little bit, but ultimately as the longer you are a manufacturing nation and the more money that you are making doing that the more it's going to increase your standard of living the more you're going to start moving into luxuries and the harder it is that your labor competition is going to be competitive against the other other nations out there who are wanting to be manufacturers themselves so now this is what china is facing and the united states has gone into something that is, I, I don't want to say is like a pointless effort, but it's not going to work. And that's really the, the issues that is now coming to the United States. As we try to bring manufacturers back here, it is going to be very difficult to stay competitive. Now, you can inflict tariffs and subsidies and all kinds of stuff to try and keep the manufacturing base here, but ultimately you would have to constantly maintain that sort of position in order to keep those manufacturers. Now, that is, in my opinion, a malinvestment. Like the more you have done this, the more you have to do it. So if it used like taxpayer money to create this factory or these factories, then you're gonna have to constantly use taxpayer money to keep them in operation. Now, that's the United States strategy. China's strategy is a little different. Instead of trying to do subsidies and try and do tariffs and stuff like that, what they're gonna do is just create a whole lot of manufacturers of a particular product. Now, for example, I'm gonna use batteries. Now, I left a link down in the description to a Bloomberg, Bloomberg article talking about how the overproduction of batteries is overwhelming the world, right? Like China produces enough for the entire globe, but yet here you have America and Germany and all kinds of places, you know, all over Europe, all trying to do something very similar to what the United States is doing and to try and bring that manufacturing back closer to the domestic location to try and bring a more secure supply chain. I mean, I think this is probably the arguments that a lot of people would hear out there. What China's going to end up doing is creating so much of it out there, creating so many factories that produce these batteries that they are going to overwhelm the competition. Now, they know. They know there's going to be an oversupply. They know that's going to drive prices down and they know that's going to shut down a lot of their own facilities. Now, as these facilities start to shut down due to the fact that they are no longer competitive with the overwhelming supply that now hits the, hits the globe, factories in the United States and Europe and all that will not be able to be competitive, right, as the prices fall. Some of the factories in China are gonna make it, not all of them, but some of them will. And so it becomes survival of the fittest. And if you have the most out there, it's survival in numbers, right? Safety in numbers of them. So you think about it. China produces a whole lot of factories out there that make these batteries, knowing that they are not going to all make it, but also knowing that if they have enough of them, that they will overwhelm the competition. So as the factories begin to shut down, the ones that are remaining will be the ones that have basically been the most efficient operations within China, where all the rest of the nations will end up suffering with the overwhelming global supply. You see what's happening here? See, China's been through this game before. Like, they, they know 
exactly how the economy operates. They know the rise and fall of nations and what causes it to take place. They know about the increase and decrease of money. I mean, you think about it, there was a time in which that, and it's a really good story too, I wish I could remember the name of the mountains down there, but down in South America, there was these two mountains that were pretty much made of entirely of silver. Like one of them was just like this huge mountain, just completely made of silver. And they took this mountain and pretty much turned it upside down into a hole, right? And took all the silver and sent it over to China. And now China really loved this whole thing going on because now they had a lot of a lot of money within their economy to do transactions with and this was working out really well until that silver mine ran out depleted and no more silver was coming into china they were suffering with the fact that they did not have enough money within their within the country to do the transactions and this is when opium started moving in and started doing transactions with opium and then the whole then you know opium wars and stuff like that started to take place after that but the china's been through these games right so they know how the manufacturing base is gonna end up leaving China if they were to try and stay competitive with just what they have. So they overwhelm the competition with even more production out there to essentially destroy anybody else who is trying to be in the same position that they are as far as being producers of this particular product. They overwhelm the competition with as much production as they can possibly produce out there, knowing that a lot of it is going to fail, but that at the end of it, they will be the only ones with any kind of producing, with any kind of production left. All right, I'm gonna cut that one a little short today. We're just gonna go six minutes into it and start reading some of these comments. I kind of wanted to get your guys' take on this possible idea because this is something that we have been talking about quite a bit here on this channel is the manufacturing here in the United States and their attempt to bring it back and how it's just not going to be competitive against the rest of the world and it will end up failing on, on them. All the idea of like, you know, trying to bring solar panel or solar production and, you know, battery production and all this green technology back to the United States. And try and be competitive against the uh, the countries out there where there's no way that the labor cost and land cost and input cost that goes into production within the United States can be competitive against places like China and Vietnam and even Mexico. All right. Whoa, gold was up $2,430 last night. Yeah, I thought I saw it at two four like 2470 I think I saw it up at one point this morning. That was crazy, right? All right, labor costs is very high here. Yeah, and that's that's the one of the reasons why you're probably not going to see a whole lot of manufacturing coming back to the United States. Now, when I say that, it's not like the United States doesn't produce or manufacture, right? That's like it's not it's it's not like you can't bring it back and have it here. The problem with it is is it's is bringing it back so significantly that it actually reverses the trade deficits, right? Because we import a hell of a lot more than we export. And yes, I would I definitely give the powers that be some credit to try and bring that manufacturing back to try and keep that trade deficit from going any worse. But the, but the idea of reversing that isn't going to take place, right? We can, we can slow the rate of descent, but it's still gonna happen. Right? There, there is no way of, of reversing this without a complete collapse. And so, like, I understand, like, what it is that the powers of be are trying to do. What I'm trying to, like, explain for the long run, though, is, like, how this is going to be very ineffective. And how what it is, like, and what it is that China is going to do to try and maintain their manufacturing base. Because as their manufacturing base attempts to leave China, they are going to have to figure out ways to keep it there. And if you can overwhelm the competition with manufacturing so that they can't even produce a, a single item that you're producing because you have overwhelmed them, all right, and the prices are just not available to them, well then maybe you could keep it there in your own nation. And I believe that is what China is attempting to do. All right. The US, I believe, is the second largest exporter. It's not, it's, it, you okay. The amount of stuff that leaves the nation is vast. It's way more than a lot of other nations out there, but that's not the point. It's the balance, right? If you are importing more than you are exporting, there's an imbalance, right? And that means in that when you are doing that is that you are importing more stuff and you are exporting more money, 
Okay? And that's in that that's ultimately what it comes down to. The United States can be an exporter, right? We produce a lot of agricultural products. I mean, we a lot of agricultural comes out of here. Most of these ships that you see out here on the Columbia River are hauling grain out of the United States and taking it over to the Asian nations, right? Taking it over to China and Japan and Korea and all that. Right? And that's what's mostly leaving here out of out of the Columbia River are agricultural products. Timber, grain, potash, stuff like that. Like, you know, that's the type of things that are leaving. What ends up coming in are cars and I think a lot of times it'll be foreign steel, I think they actually bring in. There's other products that they bring in, but what leaves is mostly agricultural stuff. All right. Just learned to tea bill and chill today, but curious as to how to invest in gold like physical, but the transaction cost can be a problem because of buying retail and selling the whole thanks. Yeah, John, to be honest with you, man, I don't I don't invest into gold and silver. I don't invest into that stuff. I buy it, but it's just more of a speculation and not even really a speculation because even that is like with the greater fool theory, it's it's an insurance policy for me. Like I buy silver and gold and hold on to it for the idea that it's outside of the third party claim. That I don't have to worry about an envelope showing up in the mail. I don't worry about a phone call. I don't worry about a financial advisor. I don't worry about government. I don't worry about banking. I don't worry about any of that mm -hmm. stuff because it's physical in my hand. Okay? And that's an insurance policy that I really appreciate. There was a time in which that I was broke, had no money, I had a busted down car and I needed to get to work and I was able to trade 165 ounces of silver for a Tahoe and I was back on, I had my wheels again, I was back driving. That was one of the coolest things that I had ever experienced with my silver holdings and I consider it just that, an insurance policy. Investment, not so much. Like I don't really invest in gold and silver. Now, if I was to invest in gold and silver, it w and I have, I would buy the miners. I would buy gold and silver miners or something of that nature. I mean, even the idea that you wanted to use like the price movement, then I mean, not that I'm in agreement with with paper silver, but I think an ETF would be a better position to move towards if you're just looking for the price movement, you know, and trying to make money off of that. Physical is very difficult to try and invest and make money off of the price moves because there's premiums to pay, right? You pay a premium when you buy it and you pay a premium when you sell it. So either way, the movement has to be significant enough beyond the premiums to then make it, you know, worthy of, a, of an actual like investment or speculation in that fashion. I just don't see it there. Like it's very, that, that to me is not where I find the value in silver and gold. I find it in the insurance policy that gives me the ability to sleep at night knowing that I don't have to worry about any kind of third party claim. And yeah, wow, isn't it zooming? That whole gold thing is just really taking off right now. All right. Um, what do we got here? Let me cruise down a little ways. We got do, 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 deja vu. U.S. steel sale to Nippon Steel of Japan is up for vote and possibly could be blocked. Yeah. All right. Which country do you think will be the next production powerhouse? Um, I think, well, I mean, as far as like a production powerhouse, I think China is going to be the, the production powerhouse. As far as like evolving into something that is going to be grander than it is today, I would imagine that, you know, kind of the usual suspects that you're finding out there, like India, I think is going to be, you know, increasing their, their manufacturing to the world. Um, Vietnam and Mexico like Mexico is going to be a big one especially because of its location to the United States the United States is still going to be the major consumer of the world and the closer you can get to the United States the you know the better it's going to be so ultimately it comes down to like how cheap you can actually manufacture it in your country and the transportation cost to get it to the United States or to the rest of the world, wherever it is you're trying to distribute it to. Generally, the major consumer of the world is the United States, so you want to have access to the United States with your manufacturing base and 
you know, having that shipping channels already established is going to be a key factor to a lot of that because you can manufacture it in your country, but if you can't get it out of the country or get it shipped or have, you know, distribution limitations to it, then, you know, what's the point? You can only produce so much. So that's really where China is going to have like a lot of that, you know, a lot of that tied up for a long time is just simply the fact that they can distribute it out of their nation because they've already built the distribution channels. And if you also think about it, they got the Belt and Road Initiative that's also, you know, very rampant around the world. So it's going to take a while before they actually are dethroned from that manufacturing base, just like it's going to take a while for the United States to be thrown, be dethroned from having the world reserve currency. You know, these things are going to take a long time. So like trying to invest into that aspect today would be very difficult. Like, you know, you could probably see it in some of the products like these solar panels and stuff like that, that, you know, when you have an oversupply coming in such a dramatic fashion, you don't know how the governments are going to respond. You don't know how the corporations are going to respond, but you can kind of see that there's probably going to be some pretty big issues happening with these particular producers out there. And I'm not saying that this is the time that you begin to short those things, but this is kind of like the environment in which that you would short those particular companies, right? not invest into them. Now, once you have the competition and all these people are closing down and they're shutting down and you got blood in the streets and people are crying because they lost all their investment money into these particular corporations or something. And you're thinking, man, sounds like you're all hurting out there. All right? Blood in the streets. People are fearful. Very interesting time. Right? This is the time that you would want to be investing, right? That's when the environment in which that you would want to be, you know, moving back in towards it. So again, like how long, how far, who is it? That could, that might take a long time to actually figure out. Like, I mean, even still, like if you were to invest in these product, you know, these facilities today, like, hey, I want to build a facility right over there. It would take years before it would actually come online. Like, even if you. Like, I mean, I don't know, you know, exactly, but, you know, you got a lot of logistics that move into the idea that you're going to set up a factory and get it in operation and be productive with it. I mean, even after the facility is built, it still takes time to get the thing running right, you know, to get into full production and being able to produce things. I mean, you know, we're talking years down the road. And if you're already sitting in a situation in which you have an oversupply, like, we got an oversupply of this particular product. Oh, I know. Let's build a factory that makes more of those things. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. Wow. We got a lot of comments going on in here. If you guys are joining the vid, enjoying the video, go hit that like button. The more you hit the like button, the more the algorithm will spread the video around. Another day, another dose of uneducated economists. Blessings. Well, thank you so much. What is that? Barnhouse? I appreciate you, man. Uh, no hope for any of you. Ha ha, you already lost your country. Effortless? Why are you, what are you just like, just rousing it up? Just stirring the turd, huh? All right, effortless, don't make me block you, please. Yeah, all nighter, you got, you know what to do, bro, you know? All right. Uh, good afternoon, all from, all my uneducated economist people. Well, great to see you here. What is that? my glasses got my busted glasses here i can't even read with those things on all right my main economic indicator i follow is strippers index i think that would be a good one to be to be perfectly honest with you i think if you were to talk to strippers about their 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 daily experiences as far as their customers how much the customers are are tipping you know, the clientele that they actually see, you know, that, I think that's probably a really good indicator of how the economy is, is what kind of condition the economy is in. I think it's probably one of the better indicators out there. Um, you know, and so that's what's really funny about it is that if you had, like, I'm sure there is, but if you had like a very a very deep understanding of macroeconomics and the economy in general, and then was in a position as like, you know, like a stripper would be, I think that information, that firsthand real time information would be so prevalent, would be so, uh, not even prevalent, but relevant, right? And accurate 
that you would probably be like one of the best like you know economists out there as far as being able to predict what it is that has taken place within the current situation like most economists are waiting for the numbers to come out right and that's the that's where most people like everybody who is on TV all the financial advisors all the data analysis guys they're all waiting for information that we are living in real time and if you can see that information firsthand then you have a you have an advanced knowledge beyond those guys all right cruising down here uh strippers are a great indicator as is rv sales yeah uh steve carell did this in the movie the big short yeah uh, higher for longer, and well, in Dion, uh, Dion just did it recently down in Vegas too, where he was talking to a girl down on the uh, down on the strip, one of the flamingo girls, and talking to her about inflation and you know some of the things. And although he was kind of joking around with some of the questions about inflation and stuff, she actually exposed some stuff that I thought was quite relevant. You know, she was talking about how things were so much better just a few years ago than they are now, and you know. I mean, I think if you were to take that sort of line of questioning and keep going down, leading down that particular line, she could have actually brought out a lot more relevant, you know, information that um, that I think would have been, you know, pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, when talking about relocating manufacturings, are you referring to decade ahead or multi-decades instead? Okay, so think about it like this. Think about the fact that the United States was a manufacturing powerhouse back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, right? We were producing the world's greatest stuff. And then we started sending that stuff out to the world and the world was sending us their money. Then we had a standard of living that was quite elevated because of that. Like a good strong economy is built off of productions and savings, right? So if you're a major producer and saver, in fact, you're investing into the rest of the world, you're loaning money out to there to the world, they're sending you a payment. They're sending you an interest payment on that stuff. The United States was loving it, right? We were in a very, very good position to be in, right? Manufacturing the world stuff, lending money out there, had all this stuff coming in, all this money coming in. We had a high standard of living, one income, producing enough money to, for an entire household, wife, kids, vacations, cars, college, retirement, all the stuff, one income, right? This is how... The this is what a good, strong manufacturing base can do for you. Now, what's really cool about this is that that elevated standard of living makes it very easy to live. Now, I know it's probably not this, the same story for everybody, and they could say, hey, my grandparents worked damn hard, blah, 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 got all these stories for it, that's great. That doesn't change the fact that you can say that one income would be enough to provide enough for an entire household. Right, that's the point of it. That was generally speaking back in the day. Yes, there were circumstances and everybody's story is a little different, but generally speaking, you can say that. You can't say that today because something very interesting happened when we raised our standard of living is that we started moving into luxuries. As we start moving into luxuries, we do not want to spend that on higher priced items. So the luxurious items that we wanted with our higher standard of living started bringing in the foreign competition. Now, how long that takes, how quickly it moves, that's anybody's guess. So when you ask me, like, how long does it take for this higher standard of living in China to then start sending the manufacturing out in such a significant manner that it depletes the amount of standard of living that they can have in their country and they start falling into poverty and misery, how long that takes and in the course of actions in which that actually comes to fruition, who knows, right? I mean, they're going to do things that are going to try and prevent that from actually happening. Like I said, with the manufacturing of batteries, they're going to overwhelm the world and shut their manufacturing plants down. And even the ones that shut down in China, it's safety in numbers. If you have five times more than everybody else, you can lose half of them and still have operations going. And that's the strategy that China is moving into. All the rest of these nations, they're gonna set up facilities and then try to figure out how it is that they can maintain those facilities with subsidies and taxes and all this other stuff. 
So there's going to be attempts to try and prevent it from happening, but you can't stop the economic forces because that's the natural progression of things. If you elevate your standard of living, you start diving into luxuries, you start moving into more foreign production, more items that have been foreign produced, you are exporting your domestic manufacturing when that happens. So, you know, I mean, could it take an entire lifetime? Who knows? I mean, this whole process in the United States took how many years? And I mean, it's not like we lost our entire manufacturing base. We export a lot of stuff. We are still major manufacturers. We still produce a lot of good things, right? The point being is, is that our standard of living is so high, our move into luxuries is so high that we import far more stuff than we export, right? How long can that go on for? Who knows, right? I mean, I guess it goes on as long as we can keep creating debt, like the U.S. Treasury debt. As long as, you know, the country, country continues on to create the U.S. Treasury debt, then who knows how long it can go on and keep going on until that can't happen anymore, you know? <laughs> All right. Economics are bigger than political parties. If you don't get that, then you're playing the game. They want the game they want while everyone with means plays chess. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. You know, and this is where good call. Yeah, and this is where like understanding I Simon missed the notification catching up on two times. That's okay, Brody. Great to see you here. But this is really where it comes down to is like understanding that it is an economic force that is happening. Like a lot of people want to blame it on on political environment. Totally understand that. Like I, I get it. Like there's plenty of blame to go around. You can even pinpoint to write down to particular laws that cause it to that would give you the reason that is causing the actions. But you have to think like how is it that can even create a law that would be a tariff or a subsidy or anything else like that unless the environment already exists. See, this is where like, like if you don't have a productive people, if they are not industrious, if they are just sitting there doing nothing, then what is it that you're gonna possibly do to govern over them? But if they are productive, if they are producing, they are selling, they are making things happen, they are doing transactions, there's power there. Now you can have people go in there to try and govern that, right? So it's the people and the industriousness of them first that gives the environment that allows political influence to start happening, right? But you have to be there first, you know? You have to create the environment first in order for that to happen. And that's why the United States is in the position it is in because there was a time when everybody was trying to immigrate to the United States. And the reason is, is that there was so much opportunity going on here. But when you have so many people at the exact same time from all over the world coming with their ideas from, you know, back in their homeland, whether it's their, you know, their food products that they were doing, their industriousness or their farming techniques, if it was their manufacturing from, you know, engineering ideas and stuff like that, they all came to the United States and started sharing this idea and it was like concentrated here. And so all of a sudden we had all these wonderful ideas just coming to coming to life almost at the exact same time from so many different angles within this within this one concentrated location, right? That industriousness of those people is what really gave the ability for the power structure to then create create to be created in the way that it is. Right? Like if we didn't have all those people doing, working, trying as hard as they were back in the day, then the people who are in power never would have had the opportunity to do what it is that they do. <laughs> all right, what time is it? 11.39, all right guys, I'm gonna give it like another 10 minutes. Uh, Larry Bird asking for a Simon the UE audio version. Uh, <laughs> All right. U.S. exports weapons to the world, but makes every law possible to ban guns here. Look at the human centipede in the comments. Who's worse, Democrats or Republicans, while the capitalists leave out the door with the money? Well, I there's, I mean, according to Cantillon, there's three people who live independently of the state. 
the prince, whoever that you want to consider that nowadays, you know, maybe the government or legislators or something like that, right? So you got the prince, the property owners, right? The people who own properties, rent them out, have business, businesses, stuff like that, right? So you got the prince, the property owners, and then you got the capitalist who invest into that system. Those are the three people who will live independently of the state. Right? Otherwise, everybody is dependent upon the state. They're dependent on, upon like having a job from the property owner or somebody else, right? They're dependent upon, you know, the efforts of other people in order for them to have their existence. But if you want to be independent of all that, then you either have to be the prince, however that works, right? The property owner, or you have to be a capitalist who invests into that system. I'm going to be the capitalist. I'm going to be the capitalist who invests into that system. And, you know, hopefully at some point I can live independently of the state. All right. Um, God called him here to bless America. What kind of car are you in? 99 Ford Explorer. Uh, audio version of the Cantillon effect. Hmm, interesting. How do you avoid these economic pitfalls? You can't. Is there an ideal forever economy? No. Or does the party inevitably have to stop? Yes. Is this just a problem born out of globalization? No. Uh, thanks, Simon from Japan. All right. DVOTO? DVOTO? <laughs> um, all right, let's start with the first question there. How do you avoid these economic pitfalls? By understanding and internalizing this information for yourself so that you can put yourself in the best position you possibly can for you and yours, right? Nobody knows exactly how it is or what it is or anything else about your life, really. So they don't understand your goals. They don't understand your expectations. They don't understand your past, your history, your current position. None of that stuff do they understand. Only you do. So once you have internalized this information for yourself, then you can then position yourself in a way that is most appropriate for you. I know that is very difficult and it's kind of like an obscure comment to say, but when you start figuring this stuff out, when you start understanding the Cantillon essay for the way that money moves through a state, the increase and decrease of money to a state and how that drives domestic manufacturing out of the nation while it brings in foreign production, when you understand these things, you start making subconscious decisions that just align you in the right direction. And, and it's not like, you, there, I, there's no single book that you can read. There's no video out there. There's no anything that is going to give you the answer. The way this works is that you have to internalize every bit of this information for yourself. I could take in all this information and then make decisions with my life that would be very much different from what you are going to do. Because we don't have the same outcome in mind, right? What your needs are are going to be different from my needs. If you are 18 years old looking to get a start in your investments, retirements, and stuff like that on an early age, you are going to be making decisions that are far different from the guy who is 80 years old trying to retain his retirement and figure out how he's going to remain the rest of his years and still have a decent life. Right? Two totally different things that are happening there. Right? So when people say, you need to get into gold, well, what position are you in? Where do you need to be? What is it that you are expecting from this gold, right? Bitcoin, U.S. Treasuries, what is it that you're looking for? Right? These are questions that you can only ask yourself and you have to know what it is that is going to be the appropriate answer for you as far as the position that you move towards. Um, so no, there is no avoiding the pitfalls. Is there an ideal forever economy or does the party inevitably have to stop? There is no ideal. Like there is no way that anybody could come up with an idea that says, man, this is going to work 100% of the time for 100% of the people. Guaranteed. There ain't a, There is never going to be a situation that that occurs. There is nobody out there that you can vote for who can do that. If they give you any sort of idea that that's what they are attempting to do, they are lying, right? Because they can't do it. There is nothing out there. There is no economic model. There is no uh, uh, style. There's no anything, right? I don't care how you do it, right? There is nothing out there that is going to be a forever ideal, great situation 100% of the time for 100% of the people, right? It just doesn't work like that. So, no. Um, is this just a problem born out of globalization? 
No, it's not a problem born out of globalization. It's a problem that it, it's not even a problem. Like it's not, it's not a problem. It's just a condition. It's like trying to say good or bad weather. Like, what does that mean? There is no such thing as good or bad weather. It's just weather. I mean, it's a nice day out. The river is really nice and calm. People are walking around enjoying the sunshine. Hey, that's wonderful, right? I mean, it's a really nice, awesome, beautiful day out here. But then there's days in which that it is raining and pissing and, and it's really cold and the wind is blowing. And that doesn't seem very fun for walking on the river walk, but it is a great day to go out and say, go duck hunting. Right, so what is it that you're planning on doing? I mean, if it was a beautiful day like this, duck hunting may not be that much fun, right? You know, it's like usually when you have worse, bad, blowing, horrible, cold weather is when the waterfowl is moving, right? So what are you doing, you know? I mean, it's just like, what kind of position do you, are you in? It doesn't matter what the weather is. It doesn't matter what the economic condition is. It doesn't matter what's going on out there on the river, right? I mean, you think about it. There's a big giant freighter sitting right out there right now. It's a it's a water vessel, right? And now if you're sitting in a 12 foot duck skiff, you're out there in the same condition that guy is in. The exact same condition, right? There is no difference. Right? And you're both out on the rivers, the same weather conditions, the same river conditions, everything is the same, right? But the decisions that you make inside of that duck skiff when you're operating out, up and down this river is going to be so different from the guy who's operating that freighter, right? I mean, they're not even thinking the same thing. They're not even like they don't even have the same thoughts running through their mind, but yet they are in the exact same environment, right? That's the way you need to look at the economy. Like most people look at it as somebody else's view is appropriate or inappropriate. That's not the way it goes down. It's your view and whether or not it's appropriate or not. It doesn't matter what that other person's thinking. You know, it, it really doesn't. All right, thanks for your response and opinion on the physical gold and silver trading. And I agree, government cannot change economic reality, but a nation of laws protecting private property rights best. Yeah, no, I do agree with government involvement in some things, like protection of privacy protection of private property, um, the international trade of laws, like, you know, even like state trade, you know, like, you know, being able to interact interstate, right? Some of these things government influence is, is helpful on, right? When it starts getting intrusive, you can't do this, you need to do that. You know, these are the laws that you need to abide by. And if a state can come in there and say, no, we don't agree with that, then I think that's great, right? You know, give give marijuana for an example, just a very simple one on this, right? Federally, it's illegal, right? You can't, you're not supposed to have weed. The, the, the United States has been that way for a very long time. Oregon, it was never a crime, you know that? They decriminalized marijuana a long time ago, back in the 70s, I think, right? So you could have marijuana in the state of Oregon, Right? Not, you couldn't carry it, you couldn't sell it, you couldn't grow it. But as far as like possession, like if you got caught with it, it was a misdemeanor. You paid a $600 ticket and you went on your way. Like it was confiscated and you moved on. As long as you weren't driving, selling, producing, something like that, nobody lost their livelihood, nobody went to jail, and then none of that crap happened, right? None of that, none of that stuff did. And so even though there was all these laws out there that made marijuana illegal, Oregon was never, it was never a crime. As long as you had less than an ounce, you, you know, you paid a fine and you went on your way. And that was that, you know, no, no big deal. And so understanding how it is that that process takes place, right? How it is that there's a federal law that makes it illegal, but yet a state can step in and say, no, nah, we're cool with it, right? We're not, we're not going with that, right? It's because they... The, go the government can't really tell a state what to do. They can tell the states how they can interact with each other, but they can't really tell a state what it is that they can do. That's left up to the state itself, right? And this is how, like, the government was structured, so that it comes down to the people's decision. Like, if you really follow the Constitution and you really understand it, it comes down to you are the highest authority on the land. You realize that, right? Like, there is no higher authority than me. I'm it. 
and and like as long as I conduct myself in an appropriate fashion, there's nothing that anybody can do to come and take that away from me. Okay? And now I know that's a very probably backwards thinking for a lot of people out there, but it is the ultimate truth, right? When it comes time for authority to come to you and say, hey man, I need you to identify yourself, tell me where you're going, doing all these other things, and unless I have committed a crime, committing a crime, or about to commit a crime, I don't have to say anything. And I am done with the conversation. In fact, I'm leaving. You know, <laughs> that's it, right? This isn't consensual, and I don't have to participate in with it any further. I don't care who you are, right? But if you can't articulate a crime, I'm out of here. Right? And knowing that, knowing that from the get-go, and understanding how it is that these laws have been implemented in such a way that we ultimately volunteer our freedoms away, right? This is this like this is the understanding, the level of understanding that we all should have. Did I get a super chat? I did. Let's go check that out. DB, thank you so much for the five dollars, man. Are we starting to see dollar milkshake, USD index, and gold going up at the same time? I believe we are. I believe right now we are starting to see the dollar in uh, the dollar milkshake theory really playing out. And if you really want to understand the dollar milkshake theory, take a little bit of time out of your day. Go check out Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake theory, and it is very telling of the situation that we are now in. There, the idea that. The demand for the dollar is fading away is really illogical. That is not taking place. Like the, the, the people out there in the world are not throwing their dollars in the street. They are not sitting in a situation in which that they are trying to abandon the dollar. They are not doing any of that stuff. The demand for dollars is quite extreme. And that's the reason why you're seeing the US dollar index as high as it is. Very few people take into consideration how much demand for US dollars exists outside of this country that has nothing to do with the United States. Like literally nothing, not to do with our government, not our banks, not our corporations, not our people, nothing. Has nothing to do with the United States, but yet these are contracts that have been written in dollars that are due in dollars. Okay? That's a demand for dollars that is much more than anybody has really given any kind of consideration for. At the same time, there is the idea that people want out of the dollar. They're worried about sanctions. They're worried about the inflation. They're worried about all these things that are happening, and they think that the dollar in the United States is about ready to fail. There is no other place to go. If you are not going into a dollar-denominated debt, then you are taking risk of China or India or whatever sovereign nation that is out there. You're taking on that risk which is far riskier than the United States. The United States is the safest place in the entire world, right? The U.S. Treasury is being the safe haven. But if you want out of dollar denominated debt, where are you gonna go? Bitcoin? Eh, maybe. You're gonna go into gold. That's it, there's nothing else out there except for gold. And like I said, maybe on a lesser extent, Bitcoin. So now when you have these two situations happening at the exact same time with so much concern about what's going on within the global recessionary pressures that are happening out there, it gives very little places for people to go to except for the dollar and gold. And those two can rise together from it. Now, I think Brent Johnson describes it a little bit differently, but that's the wide view of it. And that's the way I see it going down. All right, guys, I got another super sticker. Thank you so much from Dave Hughes Farm. $1.99 with the thumbs up, man. Really appreciate that. The U.S. dollar, the cleanest dirty shirt. Yeah, that's really what it is. All right, take a look at exchange rates. Right. I like to see Brent Johnson and Peter Schiff discuss things. I feel they bring balance to each other. Yeah, they actually, though that um, debate, that they do, like, uh, I guess, I don't know, maybe a little over a year ago, a couple years ago, maybe. Um, George Gammon did a mediation between Brent Johnson and Peter Schiff as far as the debate goes, and I thought that, that was really good. Um, yeah. I don't know if he's done one of those recently. Stripper index, how cops, priests, and politicians are doing financially. Uh, who is George? George Gammon on the Rebel Capitalist channel. You know? I called in sick today. <laughs> uh, I'm going to watch George after this. My laptop is near dead. 
Alrighty guys, I think I should probably jet. Yep, I gotta go. My lunch time is over. Thank you so much for being here. This was a lot of fun. We have 295 people watching with 113 likes. Go hit that like button real quick for me so that the algorithm will grab the video, spread it around. Uh, we got $6.99 in Super Chats. I really appreciate everything you guys do to support the channel. I really appreciate the PayPal donation I got the other day from, uh, well, I'll just keep that anonymous. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it was quite significant, and I really do appreciate you taking the uh, your time out of your day and sending me a contribution of, of such manners um what else oh yeah this weekend we are going to do the members only live stream where we're going to cover michelle bowman's uh recent monetary policy speech i think that was a really good one we covered that a couple of days ago um but we're going to do a full-on review of that entire speech so i would really encourage you to to uh Check out the link down in the description to the channel to join the uh, YouTube members only channel. It's a dollar a month, but there's a bunch of content that you can go and check out that we've done in the past. So it gives you access to all those videos and then, you know, the future member only videos that I do. I mean, it's a dollar a month, $12 a year, $120 for a decade worth of hardcore information that I feel I put a lot of work and time and effort into that really I don't know how many people out there are really doing the level of research and bringing that research to the to the YouTube channel like I have done so I really appreciate everybody who's uh, who's participated in that as well so thank you all for being here um, I'm gonna read one more just because it's Benny all right it was me no need to keep me anonymous yeah right Benny it was <laughs> taking credit for it and that was pretty cool all right Uneducated economist, you guys let me know.